We will have no other gods before you. Nothing on earth will compete for How many people are on Twitter? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press you a little bit this morning on some things that maybe are talked about in church or chapel. And I, I know that uh, some of what I'm going to say is very sensitive, so I want to create an avenue, just one avenue stream. Um, if you're on Twitter and you can do it right now, just go ahead and go on there. I know um, you're not supposed to be on the internet right now, but we know some of you are already, so that's okay. Um, just follow me, and I, then I will in return follow you. We'll do the Christian thing. We'll follow each other. Uh, Josh Graves, at Josh Graves. And for some of you who may feel a burden by some of what I share, um, I would like to keep this conversation going. I, I'm coming to believe in my life that without disagreement, we can't learn anything. In fact, I think that's the whole premise of a university like this, which I am proud to be a graduate of. Well, we're off, uh, coming off of the Super Bowl hangover, and I was thinking this morning about one of my favorite, not that kind of hangover, whoever laughed over here, <laughs> metaphorical hangover. Um, I was thinking this morning about one of my favorite NFL football stories. It comes from a, a running back for the Denver Broncos named Floyd Little. Floyd Little was playing against Dick Butkus, who is uh, just kind of an old-time tough guy character in the NFL, one of the great linebackers in its history. One game, Floyd Little was determined that he would get the best of Dick Butkus. He would not allow this intimidator to get his way. So it was about the second quarter, and, and Floyd Little had just been pounded over and over again. And, and he had a play where he came across the middle, and Dick Butkus laid him out flat on his back. And all he could see were little dark splotches out of the corner of his eyes. He thought, he'd, he, thought he, could, he couldn't feel anything. He didn't know what was going on. And then Dick Butkus looks over his face, and he says, Floyd, are you Okay. He says, I'm fine, man, I'm fine. Just give me my space. Just give me my space. He says, no, Floyd, are you okay? And Floyd kind of picks himself up, and he's limping around. And Buckkiss is following him, and he's thinking to himself, what is this guy doing? Leave me alone. Just get away from me. Over and over again, Buckkiss keeps saying, Floyd, are you okay? Finally, after about 30 seconds, he says as loud as he can, the crowd is cheering, Buckkiss says, are you sure you're okay? And he says, man, leave me alone. I'm an NFL running back. I'm tough. Leave me alone. And Buckus says, Floyd, you're in the wrong huddle. What are you doing, man? And for a little bit, I am going to cross over to the wrong huddle. Because what I want to share with you this morning, in some ways, I have no business talking about because I was born in the comfortable confines of the suburbs of Metro Detroit and so much of what I'm going to share is secondhand. It isn't personal lived experience. But my fear is if we stop talking about these things, then we will start, as I've seen in our community, we'll start to repeat some of the same old mistakes that have been going on for 5,000 years. On the screens here in just a second, if you can bring that up, you'll see an image of two iconic leaders in the 20th century. I talked recently uh, about this in my church community, and it was fascinating, some of the response I got. On the right is Malcolm Little, also known as Malcolm X. Some of you have probably seen Spike Lee's movie, The, Auto, the Malcolm X Story. It's a phenomenal uh, story in which Denzel Washington captures the essence of Malcolm X. On the left is probably one of America's uh, best-known leaders, Martin Luther King. Now, here's a little glimpse into their story that is often untold and often ignored in mainstream conversation about race in America. Both of them are the sons of Baptist preachers, and yet their stories go completely different directions. Malcolm Little was born in Oklahoma, lived most of his young life in Nebraska and Lansing, Michigan, an hour from where I was born. When Malcolm's family lived in Nebraska, his father was preaching for a Baptist church. 
And some of the clan, that Nebraska's version of the clan, did not like the fact that his gospel was calling black citizens in their little town in Nebraska to leave a bigger, bolder, more courageous life. They were threatened by that. Whenever you have power, you're threatened by those who don't have power. That's a story that's repeated over and over and over in Scripture. In fact, he recounts in his autobiography, which I think is one of the most important pieces of literature written in the 20th century, with Alex Haley, he records the story that men, he remembers as a little boy, men throwing flames into his house, taking the butt of their rifles, smashing windows of a preacher's family, telling them to move back to Africa. This was Christian on Christian Violence, And this was not the South. This was in the Midwest. This was in Nebraska. When their family moved to Lansing, Michigan, uh, a state that was known for being open to diversity because of the explosion of the automobile industry, they assumed things would get better. When Malcolm was about 11 or 12 years old, a version of the Ku Klux Klan, known in Lansing at that time as the Black Legion, started the same conversations with Malcolm's father, we don't like your message. We don't, we don't think that the, the gospel is really for everybody. Read between the lines. That's what they were saying. We want you to keep this private. We don't want you to challenge the structures and the institutions and the way things are. And Malcolm's father said, I'm a preacher of the gospel. I'm a preacher of the Jesus who called people out of their death, their death and into new life. This is who I am. It's who I've been called to be one afternoon, as most married couples do, Malcolm's father, Earl, had an argument with his mother, and he decided to go for a long walk. And Malcolm remembers in his autobiography, he says, as my father was leaving, I will never forget looking at the back of his head, and for some reason, not even turning around, he put his hand in the air and waved back, knowing that our family was looking. Malcolm would never see his father alive again. No one was ever charged, but it is a well-known fact in the city of Lansing in the state of Michigan that the Black Legion, Michigan's version of the Ku Klux Klan, took Malcolm's father, tied him to a railroad track while a railroad car severed his head from his neck. Christians treating Christians through the power of hell and not the power of the story of Jesus. And the danger is, for those of you, I'm 31 years old, so I'm 12, 13 years older than most of you, except those of you who are on the five and six year plan, we're a little closer in age. <laughs> the danger is that you are the first generation that really is not living closely to these stories. Your professors have, and a lot of faculty have, but you are the first generation that has, in many ways, moved past the race issues of America. And in some ways, that's beautiful. But I believe if we don't know our past, we will be orphans in the future. We have to know these stories that make up the cities, the towns, the neighborhoods where we live. And I think that's true of Nashville. Malcolm X was volatile in his 20s and his 30s. He went to live with his sister after the state broke up his family in Lansing. His mother was put into a mental institution. He went to live with his sister, and he got put in prison for breaking all kinds of rules and laws. And it was in prison that he was introduced to a radical form of Islam known as the Nation of Islam, which actually started in Detroit, not too far from where I was born, not very far from where his father was killed. And he's known now kind of in white America from sound bites like, Plym we didn't land on Plymouth Rock, Plymouth Rock landed on us. Or how can you discover something when someone's already living there, referring to Christopher Columbus Day and the way we celebrate that in our country. He's known for his volatile speech, for his hate of what he would call the white devil. But what I have noticed is the lack of truth-telling on the part of many white historians about Malcolm's family narrative that led him to the place he ended up. See, we are all products of where we come from, but we don't have to be determined by our past. But we can never completely separate ourselves from the events 
and the experiences that shaped who we became and what we valued. This is one of the few times that Martin Luther King and Malcolm X ever met. As you know from history, they had two radically different messages. Martin King was committed to nonviolence and love that was willing to suffer on behalf of others, even in the face of some of the worst injustice this country has ever known. Now, Martin King's story is very different. He was also born into a Christian home in Atlanta, but he was in many ways protected in a bubble. Um, they re his parents recognized from an early age that he had a remarkable gift for oratory, and they protected him. He felt some of the effects of racism, but nothing like Malcolm X experienced. What I want you to see is sometimes in the South, the story is told a little bit, I think, untrue to reality. Race is not a Southern thing. It's a human thing. Racism is not a Southern thing. It's a human thing. On almost every continent on the planet right now, there are significant issues. And if you peek back behind the curtain, most of them go back to two things, race and money. And you can trace most cultures' histories through the lens of those two elements. Martin King was talented. He went to uh, Morehouse College at an early age. He then went on to Crozer Seminary in Pennsylvania. He then went on to do a PhD at Boston University. Um, and he had this remarkable decision moment in his life, which many of you will have to face pretty soon. He had to decide how he would use his education. Would he stay in the academy and in a university setting where he had all kinds of invitations because of how intelligent he was? Or would he go and complete the task he thought he'd been called to all those years before, and that was to be a preacher? Again, another story that isn't told in American history um, is that Martin Luther King was a preacher. The primary way he understood the world was through the stories the Bible gives us. And while he's been demonized as a communist or a socialist, I still hear some people refer to him as Martin Lucifer Kuhn. While he's been demonized in so many circles, the tragedy is that people miss Martin Luther King knew the Bible as well as anybody, if not better, in this room right now. The Bible had been the food that had sustained his life for the, his first 26 years before he became a minister, when he was trying to decide between would he pursue the route of academics or love the church, serve the church. In some ways, maybe even a false dichotomy, but as he was wrestling with that, he said he only heard God speak to him a few times his entire life. I can identify with that. Some of you, God speaks to you every day. God tells you what clothes to wear, whether you should supersize your combo, and what movie to go watch. I've never had that kind of interaction with God. I've always, it, it feels like I've always had to listen. He's, King says God spoke to him twice in his life. And the very first time he said he heard an audible voice that said, Martin Luther, as he was looking at his daughter asleep, thinking about what her future looked like in a country that said all people were created equal but didn't live up to that ideal, he said he heard the voice of God say, Martin Luther, as it had to Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all of these men and women in the past, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for truth. Stand up for justice. And lo, I will be with you to the very end of the age. The rest is history. He claimed his role as a preacher in the United States for the good of the United States has never been the same. I've often thought about in, in the different writing and studies I've done on these two men who grew up in Christian homes. I've often wondered, had Malcolm X been exposed to the gospel of Jesus and not the gospel of American individualism and exceptionalism, I've often wondered what Malcolm Little could have done for the kingdom of God in the United States. See, Malcolm X is a mirror to white America. And while we have moved and progressed in remarkable ways in this country, if we forget these stories, then when new challenges come, and new people groups emerge in our society, we will repeat them if we don't remember the horror 
and the shame that came just 50 years ago on our soil. Malcolm X is a reflection of a perverse gospel, a neutered gospel that isn't the gospel that Jesus taught and lived. And yet, at the same time, Martin Luther King is a mirror of the best of what Christianity has to offer. I want to say something to those of you who are not Christian. I do not assume that because this is a Christian university that all of us are Christians. That would be a ridiculous assumption. Some of you have rejected Christianity for good reasons. By good reasons, I mean thoughtful reasons. Now, some of you have rejected it because you're morally lazy or, or you have anecdotes that you've just lived by and you've never worked through them. But some of you have rejected Christianity because you have seen the injustices that in the name of religion have been put on other people. And I want to say to you, please, please be able in maturity to differentiate between the Jesus of history and the shortcomings of the church. Please be able to dif differentiate between that. And for those of us who are committed to the way of Jesus, let us never be afraid to tell the truth about who we are, both in our personal lives, where we are individually, the sin that haunts us and struggles us, to corporately, collectively, communally talking about the true events that have happened in the name of Christianity. Okay, again, speaking to Christians, if if we're afraid to talk about our sins and our injustices, what do we need Jesus for in the first place? To be Mr. Rogers with a beard? To make us feel better at night so we can tell everybody else that isn't going to the place that we're going when we die? Is that what we've reduced Jesus to? This text that Keila asked me to speak from is powerful. I want you to hear these words from Colossians 2. If you could bring those up. I'm going to move down a little bit. In verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith and the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all of us our sins. You notice that's plural there? It's not you individually, it's our sins having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, Jesus made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. For both Jesus and Paul, the cross is not simply the source of our salvation, it is also the shape of our salvation. The cross is not meant to merely save us from something. It's also meant to save us for something. Jesus says, how many times, as you have written behind me, if anybody would really want to be my disciple, he or she must come and take up their cross. That, that is the invitation of Jesus. I have named, I have exposed, I have resisted, I have shown the foolishness of the systemic injustice of evil as it plays out in the world. That's the last verse that Paul gives us. And Jesus is saying, who wants to join me in that project? About seven years ago, I was invited to speak at Michigan State University, which is, I think, the third or fourth largest university in the United States. And the, the panel was quite intimidating. It was a group of religious leaders from all different faith traditions. Now, I don't mean Baptist, Church of Christ, Pentecostal. We're all on the same team, okay? I mean all of the faith traditions that are represented now in the United States. We had a, um, an imam. We had a Baha'i leader. Uh, the Baha'i do not have official clergy. We had a rabbi. Um, and, and we had people representing the Buddhist faith, all different. And we had this fascinating discussion with students from Michigan State University called Join the Conversation. And they were allowed to ask any question they wanted to as long as they put their name on it. And we would try either in that time or in a later follow-up period to answer the questions that these university students were asking. We talked about suffering, um, 
We talked about addiction. We talked about the legacy of slavery in the United States. We talked about all kinds of stuff, Te technological development and its role on faith and spirituality. And we got to the very end, and one student asked each religious leader, could you, in one soundbite, one succinct paragraph, which is always dangerous to ask a preacher, right? Could you succinctly describe why you believe what you believe? And the conversation moved from the Imam to the Baha'i to the Buddhist to me to the last person on the panel. There's a professor named Dave Keller who teaches. He was the only other Christian clergy on this panel. And he said, I'm going to do the Jesus thing. I'm going to answer your question with a story. He said, in the early 1960s, when I was a young boy, I remember watching a TV show called The Patsy, starring Sammy Davis Jr. Some of you know Sammy Davis um, from his musical talents. He was just this, this, this uh, incredible force, personality in the 50s and 60s. And he said, but Sammy Davis Jr. on this 30-minute show was playing the role of a soldier. He was the only black soldier in his regiment. He was the patsy. And all of the other white soldiers, while they accepted the fact that they had to serve alongside this guy, they refused to treat him as an equal. They did not have a place for him at the table. They asked him to go to the commissary to buy a left-handed monkey wrench. He went to buy a left-handed monkey wrench and was embarrassed. He came back. They asked him to go back to the commissary and buy striped paint. He went to the commissary. They laughed him out of the store. He went back, and this went on and on, back and forth. When finally they came up with the ultimate prank for the patsy. They had disarmed a grenade, but the grenade looked live. And when he came back, one of the soldiers took a grenade and threw it into a crowd of other soldiers. And they all watched how would, how would the fool, how would the patsy respond? They scattered. Screaming broke out. People were freaking out. And Sammy Davis Jr.'s character runs towards the grenade. And he jumps on the grenade, yelling as loud as he can, Don't worry! I'll save you! I'll protect you! And Dr. Keller now, almost a half a century later, said, That was my first introduction to the story of Jesus. The suffering servant of God who took on the shame of the world the prophet carpenter from Galilee who really believed that the most powerful force in the world is not weapons, it's not the military, it's not a great education or an impressive background, but the greatest force and power in the world is one person willing to suffer on behalf of others, especially others who don't show love in return. Paul said in 2 Corinthians that while you and I were still the enemies of God, how do you like that for a Sunday morning sermon series? The church, the enemies of God. Paul said while you were still the enemies of God, God died for you. So my question for you is all of the people that you have in your life that you consider enemies, and I, I can't know who those are, are you going to fight them? Are you going to flee them? Are you going to ignore them? Are you going to use your power to control them? Or will you go the Jesus way? Will you go the way that says, in the end, there's only one thing that wins. Love that is willing to suffer for others. Would you pray this prayer with me? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.